Hello, welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Christian Scoggs, and I saw two movies this weekend. One of them was Godzilla Minus One. It really rocks, so let's talk about it. If you didn't know that there was a new Godzilla movie that came out this weekend, it comes from Japan, actually, and is the first Japanese Godzilla movie to come out since 2016's Shin Godzilla. This one is set in post-war Japan and follows a deserter kamikaze pilot who has to navigate life in a nation still traumatized by a brutal war and being wrecked by a giant dinosaur destroying the city. We follow his experiences specifically with Godzilla as he has an encounter with him on an island right before the nukes go off and in the ocean before he heads to Tokyo. Much of the film focuses on the survivor's guilt he feels not only following the war but also after his encounters with Godzilla. It's really cool how this film uses Godzilla as a device to explore the hardships Japan faced directly after World War II. We saw a little bit of this metaphor play out in the original Godzilla, which for transparency's sake is the only other Japanese Godzilla movie I've seen. But this film focuses on the immediate aftermath of the war, whereas the original movie was nine years after the bombings. The choice to set this film right after the war really helped to ground it in a very emotional place. The motivations of each character is clear, and you feel the horrors of this creature destroying the city even more as a result. Speaking of characters, I cared about every single one. I felt legitimately bad for Kochi. He's a kamikaze pilot who left his post, and after Japan lost a war, he feels as if what happened was his fault. And without spoiling the movie, his arc doesn't really go in a direction you'd expect. There's a realization that pops up around the latter half of the film, where the characters begin to reflect on the pointlessness of war, and Kochi's arc in this movie I think accurately reflects this sentiment. You'll have to see the movie so you know what I'm talking about, but just know that it was really well done. The film's choice to criticize blind nationalism on this level is genuinely not one I would have ever expected, but I was so glad that we got it. The structure of this movie reminded me a lot of Jaws, and I mean that in a good way. The creature comes out, does some damage, and the townspeople have to get together to capture the beast in a seemingly impossible mission. Despite following this formula, the film always keeps you guessing about what's going to happen next. It always felt fresh, and I always wanted to see where the movie was going to go. I was never bored for a second. And let's talk about Godzilla himself. He's great. He's so scary in this movie, I love his design, the use of the classic Godzilla theme absolutely gets my inner soups going. And yeah, all the visual effects look absolutely spectacular. Speaking of which, did you know this movie only cost 15 million dollars to make? That's right, one of the best looking movies of the year cost 15 million dollars to make. Meanwhile, we're getting shitty Indiana Jones movies with subpar production values that cost $300 million to make, and movies about The Flash with some of the worst special effects you've ever seen. And a convicted criminal. That was made for over $200 million. My point is, you don't need a crazy budget to make a big movie work well, and I really hope Hollywood sees this one and takes notes. Now that I know what we could be getting, there's no excuse for Hollywood to be making a bloated blockbuster void of emotion ever again especially if it's a Godzilla movie. Of course, compensate your actors and crew members and everything. Just don't be stupid with like how you spend your money. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know, get creative. Like, figure out how to make a good movie. People do it all the time. Like, you know, just save your, save your fucking money. Like, Jesus Christ. Those Monsterverse movies that America makes are fun, but characterization always takes a back seat and people always excuse it. And it's, it's really frustrating. Oh, it's just, just, just a monster movie. Like, what, what do you want? Like, deep characters? Yes! That's what we want! Ah, uh, it's just a Godzilla movie, don't worry about characterization or good stories or whatever. Ah, uh, yeah, it's, it's just some animated Spider-Man movie, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's, it's literally a movie about fucking Legos, who cares, don't worry about it. Oh, it's just a Barbie movie, it's not like it's gonna be the biggest movie of the year- Oh, wait a second. You see what I'm getting at? Never settle for mediocrity. I'm still excited to see the new Godzilla and Kong movie coming out next year, especially hearing that they're finally shooting this one in IMAX, which I've been wanting for years but I don't think it'll live up to Godzilla Minus One. Obviously, this is a very strong recommendation from me. It's one of my favorites of the year. I'm probably gonna see it again soon. Uh, let's do a rating. Yeah, nine out of 10 for Godzilla. Uh, see it on an IMAX screen if Beyonce isn't taking them all up still. I did Cinemark XD and that was still a pretty good experience. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's the review. On to the next one. I then saw Dream Scenario, and uh, while I liked it, I was a little frustrated by it. If you've never heard of this movie, it stars Nicolas Cage and is about a man named Paul that randomly begins to start appearing in everybody's dreams. He becomes an overnight celebrity, and the film documents his rise and fall from grace. 
I think this one works best when it's focused on Paul as a character. He's really interesting to me and is the perfect person to have as a protagonist to a story like this. He's narcissistic, he's neurotic, but he also has a good heart and just wants to contribute something to people's life. Of course, he wants th the credit for that contribution, which adds to his narcissism, but, but you get the idea. The film works best when it's exploring how he perceives these events that's happening in him. Nick Cage also plays Paul perfectly. It's honestly one of my favorite performances I've seen from him, and I wish the Academy would give him an Oscar nomination for this. I don't believe they will, but I can dream. Where the film really falls is in its metaphors. This is about the modern celebrity, and more specifically, cancel culture. You see, the dreams begin to turn increasingly more violent, which causes people to turn against him, and ultimately his downfall. It really kind of felt random when it all happened, and Paul felt very helpless in this situation. I guess that helpless nature adds to the tragedy of everything, but it felt more frustrating than tragic. I suppose the film is attempting to work as a modern fairy tale, warning its viewers of the dangers of being desperate for the limelight, but I guess I wish that change was a little more earned and didn't feel so sporadic. The trailers also marketed a very different movie from what we actually got. I didn't mind that necessarily, but I understand that this movie is going to divide mainstream audiences 1000%. I've seen so many reviews of this already where some love it, some like it, some think it's okay, and I even saw one guy who just like flat out despised it. What ultimately makes this movie worth a watch in my opinion is the originality of the concept, Nick Cage's performance, and its humor. I also feel like I could see myself watching this again and liking it a lot more upon second watch. I probably won't go back to the theaters for round two, but I see myself giving this another shot once it hits streaming. It's very ambitious and I'd rather a movie take risks and be stale and dry. So know going in that your mileage will vary, not everything quite works, but it is worth a shot in my opinion. It's a solid 7 out of 10 overall.